All right, uh, everyone, thank you for attending our webinar today. Uh, before we start a disclaimer, uh, the content for this webinar was not generated with ChatGPT AI. A real human did that. Um, so that's important to know since we're talking about AI here. I want to make it clear that this was not AI generated. Uh, my name is Cam Cullen. I'm Glasswave's Chief Marketing Officer. And I'm joined today by Joe Baxter, uh, our solution architect, as my co-host, who's going to give a demo a little bit later on. Say hi, Joe. Hello. How you doing? So if you're a fan of, of hacking and cybersecurity movies, uh, hopefully you're in for a little bit of a walk down memory lane. Uh, as you might have guessed by the title of the webinar, Preventing the Terminator, AI-Resistant OT Network Protection. Uh, AI has been a much abused term in technology over the past few years. Uh, I am not here to talk about a great new AI tool or sell you a solution that we're saying is AI-powered. What I want to discuss is how AI is changing the OT cybersecurity landscape. I hope to make this an educational and fun session, but Blastwave as a company's main goal is to help protect critical infrastructure that powers our society today. I know that sounds a bit grandiose, um, but if you ever been, have you ever been without power or water for an extended period of time, or you can remember some of the shortages during COVID or even during the colonial pipeline hack, you rely on critical infrastructure just like everyone else. Um, and that is really important to recognize that these are the things that keep society running. So the cyber physical world is under attack. And if you paid attention to any of the news headlines over the past few years, you have seen this time and time again. Uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, has issued warnings that bad actors are actively threatening the water, energy, and shipping sectors recently, uh, and stories about attacks in these sectors and others will continue to fill the news headlines. On the AI side of things, since the launch of ChatGPT, Slashnex reports a 1,265% increase in phishing attacks, and the launch of the generative AI chatbots has really raised the stakes enabling hackers to become far more effective at things like spear phishing and business email compromise to perpetuate cybersecurity breaches, including lucrative ransomware and data theft. But where are these attacks coming from and what are they targeting? Over the past uh, year since 2005, the biggest driver in critical infrastructure attacks are really nation states. Since 2005, China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea have sponsored about 77% of all suspected operations. Note that it's just suspected. These are the ones that we know about, uh, not to mention the ones that may be happening right now that we are not aware of. And the question for us is really, what are they attacking? Well, they're attacking, uh, according to Microsoft's threat intelligence, the state-sponsored targets are mainly industries that are considered critical infrastructure. Um, interestingly enough, the report doesn't consider government critical infrastructure, but I certainly do, especially as things like elections are coming up in the United States uh, in the very near future. The report also points out, unsurprisingly, that Chinese hackers' biggest target is the U.S. Department of Defense, including all of the U.S. DOD IT and OT networks. You know, remember that DOD runs its own water, power, et cetera, and essentially active in all of the critical infrastructure spaces as a microcosm of a small city inside of a single base. Um, I mean, the bottom line is the nation states are targeting critical infrastructure. And we actually saw a blurring of the lines with cyber warfare into physical warfare in the initial weeks of the Ukraine conflict where cyber attacks preceded and were the initial phase of attacks. And the battlefield is no longer really just the front line. I would assert that AI-powered cyber attacks are a clear and present danger to critical infrastructure today. Now, as the topic of the, the webinar says, I'm not saying that Skynet is here yet, but if you remember Terminator 3, that Terminator's power was taking over computer systems and eventually even manufacturing to take, make their own supplies, but we aren't to that point just yet. Now, Elon Musk isn't sure that the day we might have that happen is too far away. He's quoted recently as saying that AI will surpass a single human intelligence next year and all humans combined by 2029. And whether you agree with that timeline or not, 
it's important to know that AI is here and is already a relevant topic for OT cybersecurity. Getting back to our movie theme though, let's, let's take a quick pause and think about how did Neo win in the Matrix trilogy? So there've been a lot of uh, anal analysis of this and people have done some really deep thoughts, but one of the common themes uh, and beliefs in the movie is that the choice, Neo's choice to fight rather than the fight itself is what makes Neo win the battle. He doesn't succeed by coming out on top. He wins by taking the battle with Agent Smith to the very end and sacrifice himself by letting Smith copy over him, essentially the virus canceling out the antivirus. If Smith had a choice, if you remember the ending of that movie, he would not have done it, but he doesn't have a choice. He's an AI and only has a purpose, and he fulfills that purpose, which is why when he does it, he dies. So let's kind of take that movie concept with AI uh, to heart. So AI has a purpose and our goal when we're protecting critical infrastructure is to frustrate that AI and prevent it from achieving its purpose whenever possible. So let's talk a little bit about the, the ways that it will try and achieve that purpose going forward to start off with. So the global intelligence community has a lot of thoughts on this topic. Uh, the UK National Cybersecurity Center issued a report on the near-term impact of AI on the cyber threat. And NQTEL, which is a investment firm focused on investments that benefit the intelligence community, published their thoughts uh, in a blog titled, Startups Needed, How Generative AI Will Spark a New Innovation Wave in Cybersecurity. Um, I recommend you read both of the reports, but I wanted to focus on a few things that were in these reports to talk about that purpose as well as the, uh, the methods uh, that we just talked about. So if we zoom in to those two reports, uh, the assertion really is that offensive AI is far ahead of defensive AI. The NCSC report emphasizes that this is a near-term threat not a long-term threat. And the NQTEL piece discusses how they need new startups needed to combat the threat and how AI can be used to both attack and defend. The problem with that is that the threat is now, not in two to three years. Um, and if AI is an immediate threat, what are the vectors that are likely to be turbocharged or helped by, by AI? Well, both reports highlight things like reconnaissance social engineering, phishing, and passwords as those that are being significantly uplifted with AI uh, and the things that can be done to take existing threat vectors that are already in action and make them stronger. So the question that we have here that I wanna talk about in this webinar is so how can we fight that Terminator today with the weapons that we have today instead of hoping for someone to bring new ones down the line? So let's first look at the reconnaissance angle with AI. Um, in the old days, hackers used a dumpster diving as a reconnaissance technique. Um, if you saw the movie Hackers, um, Acid Burn and Zero Cool attempted to break into the Gibson and they were as when they were looking for a way into that system, they essentially did dumpster diving looking for product manuals or discarded intelligence in the dumpster behind the corporation they were targeting. Dumpster diving was a uh, a well-known reconnaissance tactic back in the, the early days of hacking. In the seminal hacker movie War Games, David Lightman, who was played by Matthew Broderick, he manually researches the computer systems designer to find clues as what that password might be. There was a nice montage of him in the library and you know missing school to do research. Um, and he deduces from that eventually the password that was used for the back door by the game designer or by the system designer, which he thought was a game company. And that gave him access to Whopper, which uh, we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, so these were all very manual tactics that were done. Um, you don't really need to do that today. People can generally search social media or use Google to find a lot out about a company or a person. But AI is going to take that to a whole new level and it's gonna be vastly improved kind of the concept of dumpster diving. 
using things like ChatGPT and Google's Gemini, which are now connected to the internet in real time, is going to drastically simplify and speed up the process of reconnaissance on a target, especially unskilled or lesser skilled uh, hackers. These public domain tools, they do try to resist helping you do bad things, um, but there have been custom GPTs developed, things like Worm GPT and Fraud GPT uh, that could be used to help hackers out. Uh, and that's not even to mention state sponsor tools that we know nothing about right now. Um, you know, I used to think of myself uh, as Google search is one of my superpowers uh, that I had as a marketing person. Uh, but these AI tools kind of bring that power to everyone uh, as long as they can learn prompts or copy prompts they find uh, online. But you can find out nowadays just about anything about anyone with an online footprint, including personal information, social media activities, corporate details, email accounts, um, even what cloud services they use potentially as part of their offering. Um, these tools for reconnaissance can be used to find potential vulnerabilities in the targets you're going after. Could be known CVEs, uh, corporate processes that lead to vulnerabilities. There was one recently uh, where AI video fraud, where they actually managed to do AI uh, uh, video over a Zoom session to convince someone that the CFO wanted them to send a check and they succeeded. Um, social engineering, misconfigurations, et cetera. I mean, for example, let's suppose you find that a corporation has announced a partnership with a vendor or you see an announcement from a vendor saying they have supplied uh, a company with their products. In that case, you can search for the most commonly exploited vulnerabilities for that vendor's equipment. Don't believe me? Well, this morning I did a uh, Google Gemini search um, saying, what are the known vulnerabilities does a Fortinet firewall have? And this is what uh, was returned. Now, you could find all this with a normal Google search, but what it's done is it's made this very digestible and much more easy to use than looking through thousands of links to try and find that out. Um, and it is interesting to note that this uh, query that I had a very simple query, um, the two top vulnerabilities it pointed out to me are both ones that allow unauthenticated remote access, which is a real no-no for OT networks. So this is out there already today. Another um, example of this, if you recall in the classic movie, The Net, um, the hackers had so much information on their target, Ruth Marks, which, who was played by Sandra Bullock, they stole her identity, uh, framed her for murder and other bad crimes, uh, basically sending her on a quest to try and stop these hackers. And what they were trying to do was get their system installed in companies and government organizations and then sell backdoor access to those systems to other bad people. So this is an example of some of the results of what happens from reconnaissance. The other attack vector that I really wanted to highlight was phishing. Um, phishing is already a huge problem, uh, with some research stating as high as 90% um, of initial attacks begin with a successful phishing attempt. Now, those numbers, I've seen them anywhere from 40% to 90%, so it varies, but the point is, phishing is a real problem. Um, AI is going to make phishing better because emails now can be based on this research. Um, they don't have to be stock emails. They can be more professional. They can be personalized. Um, they can even be done in the voice of the faked identity. Um, I've seen ones where they basically tell, try to train a, a GPT on uh, using all the public content being generated by a person so you can use their voice and you can use details left over from uh, their social media posts. In fact, one of the great movie examples of this uh, was in Ocean's, Not, uh, Ocean's 8, where Nineball, who was the hacker in the movie played by Rihanna, uh, she targets a museum staff member to gain access to the museum's systems. Uh, she finds out via Facebook that this particular uh, person in the staff is a fan of Wheaton Terriers. She creates an email campaign that is targeted towards Wheaton Terriers, sends him the email expecting him to click on the link, and he does. So now she's fished him. She has his access to the system. She then escalates her privileges, gains access to the video surveillance systems for the, uh, for the museum. Uh, and once she has access, she creates a blind spot in the video surveillance system 
which is a key to the thieves exploiting uh, that video hole essentially during their heist. So you can kind of see that, you know, this, uh, some of the things I'm talking about, movies have even dramatized uh, this happening. Um, and that was a particular heist, but what really are the consequences? So we've seen, again, those, the news reports, um, but if we're to take it to a little bit of a, a movie, I want a couple analysis that were interesting. Uh, clearly in war games, the AI nearly starts a nuclear war. Um, first, it does it kind of indirectly by tricking the military into thinking that a war is starting. And when that doesn't work, it actually tries to figure out the launch code to start a war itself. Uh, but fortunately, our hero discovers a way to teach the AI a lesson by pretty much boring him to death with tic-tac-toe. I mean, if you ever play tic-tac-toe, it's pretty boring. And if I was an AI, I'd probably give up uh, trying to play tic-tac-toe myself. But hopefully things aren't that bad and we won't see uh, a nuclear war. But it may be a more realistic result of what could happen is what was happened uh, in Live Free or Die Hard. Um, if you haven't seen that movie, which is a bit of an unappreciated Die Hard, by the way, um, Gabriel, who's played by Timothy Oliphant, orders his hackers to take over transportation grids and the stock market while nationally broadcasting a, a threatening message to the U.S. government. Uh, the heroes in the movie, Bruce Willis, Justin Long, and Kevin Smith, or recognize this as what's called a fire sale or a cyber attack. It's kind of designed to disable the nation's infrastructure. And during the movie, they blow up power stations, water things, they I think tunnels, uh, they take over drones. Um, and the end goal at the end of this movie, as in many Die Hard movies, is to steal money, which of course the heroes stop, but not for many critical infrastructure sites are both destroyed, um, but also uh, exploited. So just kind of give you a little bit of a, you know, these are the things that we've seen uh, Hollywood think up that could happen with AI powered attacks, or even just using the the hacks and uh, attack vectors that are going to be leveraged even more by AI. So how can you reduce your OT attack surface against these Gen, a, Gen AI powered attacks? You know, in war games, uh, they talk about uh, the, the Colorado location essentially which is under a mountain uh, that no one can get into but even these most secure facilities it was remote access that got them in trouble and remote access is required to make things work nowadays um, so what are the tools or what are the ways that people try and protect their networks uh, from the types of attacks specifically reconnaissance and phishing that we just talked about well, <clears throat> certainly um, the most common uh, default answer to how do I protect my network is a firewall. Um, however, if you think of kind of network access as a door to your network, um, a firewall is a bit like a screen door. You can see through parts of it. Um, it's got holes. So if you're in the right place, you can see the way through it. You can pass things through it. Um, small animals or bugs or small things can get through that. Um, so if you're in the right spot, the firewall isn't very helpful. Um, what do I mean by that from a technical perspective? Well, most firewalls have intentional holes. When, when you set up your firewall, people tell you, poke a hole in the firewall for me. Um, but they're designed to let protocols go through the firewall. The problem with firewalls in today's environment is that 95% of traffic is encrypted with SSL. Um, so you're not really blocking much traffic anymore uh, that comes in and out of that network. In fact, most traffic from the inside of the network is allowed with very few real restrictions, uh, which enables things like command and control connections for malware, um, looks like legitimate traffic to a firewall. And hackers send that phishing email, the user clicks on it, and now the they have basically have a way to get inside because the internal machine has contacted them and poked a hole in the firewall. Um, people also often use create multiple levels or segments of, of the same firewall in their network uh, and convince themselves that putting more of them in a row makes it harder to get through them. Uh, and in reality, makes the network complex, is expensive, and doesn't really seem to be working in the real world. So what we then saw is people start using things like VPNs to try and protect their networks. Um, VPNs are more like a door with a code where you either put poke that in the door or maybe a badge to swipe. Um, 
one of the biggest problems with, with VPNs as part of that is that there are just too many CVEs. And if you do a search on VPN products and CVEs, you're going to see tons of them. Um, but the real problem with VPNs is that most of them today rely on passwords uh, and passwords are way too easy to steal. You know, with a phishing vulnerability we saw earlier being that main vector. Um, they've tried to add things like uh, MFA to the mix, but many of these MFA methods used in association with passwords can also be manipulated. So let's just say passwords are bad. That's the bottom line. In fact, uh, I invite you uh, to read it. Joe wrote a blog on our website called Use the Password on the Bulletin Board. And I can bet if you just think about the title real quick, you can figure out the security issue that Joe identified when he went on that network and they were told, just use the password on the bulletin board. That's not very secure. Um, and then most VPNs also provide access uh, in whole to a layer two or layer three segment. So once someone has access to that, they can get uh, across the entire uh, network themselves. So um, before we kind of uh, set you free here. And before I start the demo, um, I want to give a little bit of, just a little bit of blast wave. Um, I wanted to give the, the beginning of this session to talk a little bit about the challenge and the technology and how AI is being used. Um, but with that in mind, how, what are the things you need to do to your network to protect it from these type of vectors which are being leveraged today uh, by hackers? So BlastWave is, is a uh, kind of a cybersecurity solution that's optimized for OT networks. And it functions as that initial protection component of a zero trust network. You can think of it more like a vault door protecting all bunches of safe deposit boxes behind you. And when you have the right permissions, you can see what you're allowed to see. And if you think of like an Apple Vision Pro, I put on the, um, the Apple Vision Pro and I can see what's in all of the... Um, the boxes that I'm allowed to see because I was given the key and I've got the biometrics to, uh, to give me access to that. And we really combine three key technologies inside of our product to help protect and secure these OT networks. Uh, the first is uh, what we call network cloaking, which by the way, is not just a fancy word for firewall. Um, it both blocks access to the network behind it as well as make the network undiscoverable to scans. Um, we also support OT secure remote access that leverages passwordless MFA authentication, which helps make it phishing resistant because again, one of those big initial uh, AI attack vectors uh, that can leverage a biometric on your mobile device, uh, which Joe is going to uh, demonstrate to you pretty shortly. And then we do micro segmentation of networks without re-architecture or changing the IP addresses on your network, which is a huge problem uh, in the OT world where networks don't move very far or move very fast. And the, the equivalent is thinking of uh, just like uh, in the movie Ant-Man. So just like in Ant-Man, he went to go in and break into a safe that he knew was a very old safe. Uh, it was very, it was viewed as a very secure one, but when he gets to the safe, he discovers that's now protected with a biometric lock. Um, so you have this really old thing that's suddenly protected with state-of-the-art biometric security. And that's really what we're trying to do with BlastWave is providing uh, state-of-the-art security, protecting this old uh, network that may have unpatchable systems that are 10 years old uh, and can't be patched anymore. Uh, as Joe often says, you, you'll find things like Windows NT and Windows 98 in some of these systems because that's the last release that was supported by the vendor and they're not going to change it. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the, the products, but I did want to send a little bit of context uh, with network cloaking. Uh, Joe's going to show this again. It prevents your network from being scanned. You can't see what's happened behind that uh, until you're essentially uh, authenticated. So it creates a virtual air gap um, to prevent people from seeing what's behind that particular device. And since you can't see them or find them, no reconnaissance is possible. CVEs can't be exploited. Zero days can't be activated. And most importantly, command and control connections can't call home. Um, we actually installed in one network and discovered some of the webcams were basically phoning home to China. Uh, and the existing security solution was allowing that to happen since the call came from inside the house, which is a, a good reference for any 70 years horror fans out there. Um, 
We also support the uh, secure remote access, uh, which again is uh, for our solution is passwordless and tends towards biometrics again, which Joe will show. Um, and it's interesting when we do this, it's an immediate, when you grant privileges and revoke them, it happens in near real time. Um, and this authentication client is actually separate from the access client. So the MFA in our solution is I can put the client on any machine that I have access to, but if someone steals that machine or takes it over, they still need my mobile device and my biometrics to get access to it. So it provides that separation, which means that even a system that may want access to a secure network is there. It doesn't mean that you can uh, actually break into the system itself. And then finally, micro segmentation, which uh, enables Blast Shield to control lateral movement uh, within the network at pretty fine granularity without re-architecting your network. Um, and that's pretty significant. Um, so rather than keep on this, I will let Joe um, do a demo. So I will stop my screen share. Uh, can you share, Joe? All Great. Right. Thank you very much. Well, let's talk a little bit about how we can prevent this AI, generative AI uh, powered phishing and attacks and credential stealing and all the things that Cam has been talking about. Let's see something in action. I'm going to start out uh, with my machine disconnected here. I haven't authenticated into Blast Shield yet. And on this PC that I'll be using as my test case, uh, you'll see that as in an IP scan, or actually an angry IP scanner, which does more than just do a ping sweep. Uh, I only see myself. I'm the only one on this network. That's the only one I can see. And so let's change that here in just a second. We're going to use our Blast Shield Authenticator, uh, which gives us this QR code in the app. I'm going to share my uh, phone screen here so you can see this work uh, in real time. There's the Authenticator. I'm going to load it up. Oh, except for the fact that I want to sh move the phone out of the way. Sorry about that. I want to shoot that at that QR code. And now I get a chance to pick my network. I'm going to pick my demo network here. It wants to see my face. And that's that first level of authentication. I can also go into the, our administrative piece here, which is this orchestrator. I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. Again, using the QR code to authenticate a second time to get into this administration. Uh, bringing that up, you'll see our network administrator here in orchestrator. But what has this changed? Well, the first thing I can do is give myself access to maybe this camera here. I'm going to change that. I'm going to turn that policy on. And uh, whoops, I'm going to go to my policies. Excuse me. I'm going to change, turn this policy on here and give myself access to this security camera. Coming back to my IP scanner here, I'll hit start again and watch it scan. Here in this range right here, you'll see that uh, I will find myself, but I'll also see a security camera IP address pop up in just a moment. There it is. So now I have two IP addresses available and the security camera here are pulling its stream and VLC it takes just a moment for VLC to realize that there's a stream there. This is a security camera. It's actually mounted over here to my right in the top of this closet that is uh, providing access. I've given myself access to that camera uh, I can give myself access to more things, be able to, let's turn on, so let's turn on some light bulbs, save changes, put this RTU in here, hit that scan again, I should see four IP addresses, but the reality is I've given myself access to uh, a web page here that allows me to control uh, some power switches. We'll quickly log in. Now, if I had been a, uh, if if this had been a uh, a credential attack, somebody with a uh, with a uh, AI chatbot or something like that trying to steal my password, they wouldn't have been able to do it because even if I had a password and gave it to them without this authenticator, without this multi-factor authentication, this phishing resistant MFA, they wouldn't have been able to do anything. You see, I've turned that green light bulb on there. I can also uh, turn on the red light bulb giving myself access to this control system, turn it back off, and just to kind of simulate uh, what can be done in an OT world, turning things on and off. See that camera goes back to normal. Notice this clock here. So right now I have access to four IP addresses because inside the Blast Shield orchestrator, I gave myself, I granted access granularly to those devices. In this case, I only have access to 
uh, the device on uh, this this camera on port 440 on 554 actually. So if I go back here to this camera, uh, this policy that controls that, I've given myself RTSP access to this camera. Now watch this. I'm going to turn myself off here so I won't have access to the stream anymore. Notice the clock counting in the window here. So it's 38, 39. The minute I save this change and turn off this policy, the clock's still counting. Save this policy, get back over here, and the clock has already stopped. I have instantaneous control over that access. VLC will realize in just a moment that this video stream is no longer available in timeout. There it goes. And you'll notice that after all of that, instead of having four IP addresses because of the way I've done my policies, I only have access to three. So I can be very granular on that access. I can do that through remote access. I can do that between devices. I can micro segment. I can completely control uh, my ability to get back and forth between these devices. Let's do one more thing real quick just to show you some of the power. I've got a interactive remote access policy set up between a, a, a SCADA server. It also has ping control on. So I've got ping, ICMP and interactive remote access, so port 22, port uh, 3389. Uh, I can scan that again, see those changes, but more importantly, let's bring those two uh, different services up. So here's my remote desktop for that uh, little SCADA server. I've got full desktop control here to this device, and I've got a ping sweep running. So once again, in real time, I can turn off my policy to ping, I am no longer able to ping, but my RDP session, my remote desktop session is still available, still live. I can add ping back into this policy, save those changes, and ping is happening again. So instantaneously, I can control uh, access to these devices inside the Blast Shield network. Uh, without much trouble, without learning uh, five to 15 different types of syntax for every firewall vendor out there. I can use the existing network, the existing plumbing, use our Blast Shield overlay on top of it without re-architecting the OT network, changing IP addresses and all that stuff. We don't need to do that. Be able to provide strong, phishing-resistant, multi-factor remote access, which is key but also the segmentation and even micro-segmentation between devices so that one system can't uh, interfere with the production of another system. So two PLCs, two RTUs, two uh, relays side by side, if one of them becomes affected or one SCADA server becomes affected, uh, it can be shut off, it can be completely isolated and controlled behind its own micro-segmentation. Uh, Cam? All right. Uh, you can stop sharing and send it back to me. So we, we just wanted to do a, a really quick demo because I think, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, as they always say. Um, and I wanted to give a, a view of that. And a couple of things I just want to point out. The remote access uh, that you saw with Joe was real simple. He clicked on that client. He basically pointed his phone at it and it did all the rest of it automatically. So you don't have to remember your password or write it down on, on a sheet of paper. Um, you saw the instantaneous effect. So if you're in an OT network situation, either you need emergency access because something bad is happening, or there is an insider threat that you're trying to prevent uh, uh, or stop essentially in process, you can do that uh, in real time. So the, the product, um, we'd love to, to, to give you a demo of that, uh, and we would be happy to do that. But I wanted to leave a few takeaways um, for, for you. So, A, I hope the session was, was entertaining. <laughs> um, I hope it was also educational. Um, you know, we do see AI uh, as, a, as a threat. And our focus has been how can we uh, prevent and frustrate those attacks that are going to come from the offensive AI, because that's way ahead of the defensive AI. Um, and we believe very strongly strongly that the best way to do that is to minimize the attack surface, uh, especially in the areas where AI is turbocharging. So cloaking stops you from reconnaissance, the secure remote access stops you from the phishing, and then uh, micro-segmentation prevents you from escalating your privilege once you get in, if you're an insider or you happen to find another way into the network. 
So by protecting against these vectors, uh, you can frustrate these attack vectors that are used by AI today. And the honest truth of what we're trying to do and the thing that the reports that I referenced talked about is we want to put OT networks out of the reach, out of uh, very rudimentary or unskilled hackers who now with AI have the ability to cause you pain that they did not before. Um, nation states will continue to find ways in their work through, but we can continue to frustrate those. But let's get the gnats out of the way. And I was talking to our CTO at one point, and I wanted to see if there was a way to show the attacks that we had stopped against the system. And his point was, well, you're never going to see them because the users never get through. And once once they get through our system, they're already authenticated and they're 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 shielded. So if we tried to do a report on the attacks that we block, it would be pretty boring because they can't scan, they can't see anything. So there's nothing to report on because they can't have access to it. And what you really have to worry about uh, is necessarily is an insider threat, which again, that micro segmentation um, brings into play. So by protecting against these vectors and frustrating the easy attack vectors, we believe that puts people in a strong position to not let your OT network be the one that's in the headlines um, in the news. You know, I think there have been multiple water uh, uh, agencies that have been in the news because they've been hacked. Um, the vulnerabilities to water systems and SCADA systems, as Joe was showing, um, are, are well known and they're out there and happening all the time. So what we would uh, like to kind of leave this as uh, with Blast Shield, we're trying to put a, a Blast Shield over OT networks and ensure that hackers don't disrupt your critical infrastructure. Um, there is an ebook that goes, uh, that accompanies this webinar, which kind of talks about this in a little more detail. Um, if you want a demo of the product that Joe gave or do a trial or just learn more about Blast Shield, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. My email is very simple. It's cam at blastwave.com. And Joe's is joe at blastwave.com. Um, I saw a few questions in the um, uh, question bar around getting copies of slides. And I see a couple of people have put their uh, email uh, address. Then we'd be happy to do that. So we will send you the uh, the deck. If anyone else uh, wants the deck, just let us know. Um, but I also want to open this up for questions. Uh, so if anyone has any further questions or technical questions, I'd be happy to uh, to answer those as well. Real quick, uh, while people are doing that, Cam, uh, one of the one of the questions that did come in was talking about vendor access, and I wanted to hit that specifically. Uh, with Blast Shield, we can schedule vendor access, so it's simplified secure remote access, even for vendors, uh, through the Blast Shield client and authenticator system uh, to be able to get into the Blast Shield network. So you can provide a vendor access to just their devices, the ones that they're supposed to work on very granularly. And you can also cancel that app access uh, on a schedule. And it happens just as fast as you saw just now in the, in the short demonstration where that vendor, they don't have to log off, anything like that. It just literally shuts them off. So I wanted to mention that as another use case here uh, within the Blast Shield system. Yeah, that's a good point, Joe. I mean, that the, the infamous target hack from a number of years ago, um, uh, that was basically a contractor that came in. If you work at the building industry, uh, building smart buildings and remote access, or uh, you, even in a data center where you're trying to let someone work in and, and work on the HVAC or uh, those type of systems, that that temporary access is a big problem. And that gets uh, uh, that's a hole that gets exploited all too often. Um so we do, uh, there was a question that came in about uh, zero trust security and kind of what that means. <laughs> um, uh, the, the real answer is it would probably take me longer than this webinar to explain it. Um, but a simple uh, concept is, I'll, I'll go back to the point I made with network cloaking when I said network cloaking isn't a firewall. And the reason why I say that is a firewall is designed to let traffic in and out of a network. That's fundamentally designed. Yes, it's designed to block traffic, but it's also designed to let traffic in. What a zero trust infrastructure is, is you cannot enter or view or have access to my network unless I validate that you are who I think you are. And as Joe showed in the demo, in his case, he wanted to access his, his little network that he had. He had to prove that he was uh, allowed to by a having the client properly installed and 
um, basically invited to the network. When he tried to log in with a user ID, it said, I need to see your phone, your mobile device, and I need your biometrics to authenticate to that phone and tell me on the client that you're going to be allowed to do that. So we didn't let Joe see anything at all in the network until he proved that he was really Joe um, by both authenticating himself with his phone and his biometrics, which is the multi-factor aspect of that. So zero trust is about, you are not allowed to go into my, uh, my building essentially until I let you in. And you can think of it in the military terms as the, the gate guard standing there that you have to prove yourself of who you are before he'll let you in or the vault where you scan your biometrics to go in and, and access your, uh, uh, your safe deposit boxes. So that's really fundamentally what zero trust is. Um, the other part of zero trust that Joe showed a little bit about, he had access to his own network, but he wasn't given access right away to all of the devices on his network. So this, I may trust you as my employee to do certain things in my network, but I may not trust you to do others. So, you know, I, I like Joe a lot, but maybe I'm not going to let him, you know, run marketing for, for Blastwave. Um, and Joe's not going to let me configure the software uh, code that has been written for the for the system uh, because I would probably leave a bug in and it would uh, cause vulnerabilities. So each person has the things that they're supposed to be able to do. So with Blastwave, part of Zero Trust is I'm only going to let you do what you are allowed to do and not do anything else. So that's kind of this lateral movement um, within a network itself uh, to kind of expand your privilege or escalate your privilege, like I mentioned, that was happened in Ocean Eleven uh, when she fished out uh, that one employee. Um, another question I got is, uh, are there ways to identify offensive attack focal points, um, essentially the number of times being hit as a data point to determine what externals are seeing as the weak points? That's a really great question. Um, yep. And the answer is, yes, there are. Um, Blastwave is a partner with uh, several companies uh, people like Dragos, for example, uh, that run um, threat intelligence type of systems. Um, you can monitor networks uh, with these tools, uh, both IT and OT side, and they will identify the uh, the attacks that are attempting to get into your network. Or if you're going to do a, a a trial, for example, with uh, with Blastwave, what we might do is put one of these systems on your network for several days ahead of the uh, actual installation and trial of the Blast Shield product and put the Blast Shield in. And once you put our system in, what you'll see is there are no more attacks and, and what Dragos and uh, those type of systems would report basically goes down to zero. Um, so we can, with our visibility partner, so part of uh, zero trust that I mentioned is the protection aspect, which is what we do. There's a second part of that, which is visibility, which are what uh, these vendors do and they can help you understand what's happening to your existing network. And once we are installed, they can basically become the uh, the filter to determine if something is slipping through uh, or someone internally is doing things they're not supposed to do, even though they are maybe authenticated or allowed to do that. Um, so that's some of the privilege management uh, pieces of the system. Just to tag into that really quickly, with some of those technologies, we work on an API uh, level with them so they can actually deliver some of that threat information directly to Blast Shield and the orchestrator. Um, many times in an OT network, you, uh, you know, automated security uh, and remediation can be very dangerous. Uh, a chattering network card might bring down your entire production network or something like that if it's identified as a threat. So a lot of that automation uh, while possible, is usually not pursued uh, on an OT network, but it certainly can inform, it can certainly provide alerts, and then you can take action on them very, very quickly inside Blast Shield to prevent, remove that access. Yeah. Um, and kind of on that, so I see a couple questions here around firewalls and understanding the OT. So um, when we, when we, without, again, pulling up a, a diagram of kind of the Purdue model, the IT network will have firewalls and have its own protection mechanisms to prevent people from getting into the IT network that are not supposed to. Generally, uh, we would recommend that you have a separate system uh, controlling access in into the OT side of the house. So um, one of the questions that was asked around um, how you can get to OT devices through a firewall uh, or 
understanding uh, uh, how that happens. So uh, as Joe just mentioned, um, we can take, for example, your existing network, put a visibility solution on that, and it can tell us all the devices that are present on that network itself, uh, which we can then feed into our system and say, oh, uh, this system, for example, already has classified that these are uh, SCADA servers and these are a video, uh, webcams and these are uh, sensors, et cetera. So they can basically determine what those devices are, which gets fed into the policy system that Joe showed, uh, which we would allow then say, rather than doing uh, like a firewall, maybe say allow um, these IP addresses to these IP addresses with these protocols, Joe just said, let uh, administrators have access to cameras uh, with the, the video protocol. And that's it. It's, it's much more simple to configure. So it is a little bit different um, than uh, the way that firewalls behave. And uh, in terms of getting those devices in on the OT side, that's what we, Joe was talking about with the APIs. So the, 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 in our system, it isn't a, a, a kind of a one-way firewall like you would think you might be you're doing, that we're doing that. We're basically saying that only people who are authenticated can come in from the outside. And those internal OT devices can talk to their OT controllers, which are on the OT network, but they can't talk to internet connected devices because they're not supposed to or not allowed to. If they need to, that's a separate point of discussion and we can allow that. Uh, but generally speaking, you typically don't want an OT device to uh, just be chatting to to the internet for uh, on random ports or or to random IP addresses as well. All right, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, so uh, I think that's all the questions that we have now. Um, I do want to thank you for coming to the event. Um, uh, as I said, my email is cam at blastwave.com. Uh, if you want to reach out, I encourage anyone who is interested to uh, uh, just check out uh, our site and our solution and uh, request the ebook, and we'll be happy to send it on the way. Um, but thanks for taking your time today, and we appreciate your attention. Have a good rest of the day.